Good morning, good evening, uh, good day, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to our uh, fourth workshop, which is uh, related to our um, Oxford University Press uh, book uh, on technology upgrading in emerging economies. Uh, we had um, several very successful workshop. Uh, the last, the next one, the last one will be uh, in April. And in each of the workshops, we uh, discuss uh, one section of the book, one thematic topic in the book. And uh, the last uh, thematic uh, issue is this um, issue of innovation policy for technology upgrading. For those that do not know me, I'm uh, Slava Radosevic. I'm uh, here at UCL, Professor of Innovation Studies. Uh, I'm here because I'm one of the four, uh, five co-editors of, of this volume, together with uh, Zhang Dong Li uh, from Seoul National University, Kun Li, who is uh, also now with us, also from Seoul National University, Dirk Meissner from Higher School of Economics from Moscow, uh, and Nick Von Ortas, who is unfortunately unable to be today with us, um, who has uh, several heads uh, uh, to, uh, for sure, George Washington University and University of Campinas, which is the organizer um, of, of this uh, event. We have uh, excellent support from Guilherme um, da Silva, who is uh, here in the background. If there are any problem, technical problem, I hope we'll, we'll have uh, some solutions. Uh, so that's the, for introduction, we have uh, three excellent uh, speakers as uh, the, the book will be um, coming out in June and we will also have uh, after some time open access uh, because the, the topic of that book is such that really it has to be, um, you know, widely available. Uh, on today's session, we are addressing uh, three issues uh, which are nicely complementing each other. First one is the uh, example of very successful uh, policy uh, in China of using large scale programs to help develop technological capability. So from China, we have uh, Gao Hu Dong, who is the uh, professor at the Tsinghua University. Uh, he's engaged in a numerous um, project uh, uh, in this area. So man, which is kind of really has his hands on on a variety of um, uh, projects related to uh, companies, uh, to uh, also policy practice in uh, China. So we'll, he will be talking first. Uh, second speaker will be Carlo Pietrobelli, who will be talking about the industrial innovation policies in the world of global value chains, because today any industrial policy has to consider the role of global uh, value chains. It's a, it, you could notice the, the literature today, which uh, tries to link uh, um, innovation system with the global value chains, uh, global value chain oriented policies and so on and so on. And Carlo Pietrobelli is one of the leading kind of contributors in that area in the world. He's a professor at the uh, University of Rome, uh, Roma 3. He was involved in the past um, also in the uh, policy work uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank. He's also uh, attached to uh, UN uh, Merit, to Georgetown University. So really a competent person to give us an overview of, of that uh, uh, issue of, of chain and industrial policy. And then uh, we have uh, as a third speaker, Evgeny uh, Kuznetsov. For a number of years, he's an, uh, currently senior research fellow at the World Bank Migration Policy Institute. He's for a number of years consultant of the World Bank, uh, working on uh, different world regions, uh, very much active in Latin America, and man with really hands-on understanding with the know-how of the policy issues. And you will notice also uh, a, a man with the uh, quite distinctive views uh, on uh, the uh, industrial uh, policies. Why? Because he's very much engaged also in the implementation side. And, and so this will be a count which is not entirely kind of uh, overcomes all the deficiencies of only kind of let, let's let me put it academic uh, view on that. And then we have a privilege to have uh, discussions. Uh, and um, today we have two discussions, not only one. Uh, and there are two because uh, uh, I came across uh, a paper uh, from the IMF, you wouldn't believe, whose uh, title is The Return of the Policy That Shall Not Be Named. I look at it, what is that? Uh, subtitle is Principles of Industrial Policy. 
and I was, you know, taken completely by surprise that something like that, uh, so um, let me put it heterodox and very analytical, excellent, uh, comes out of uh, IMF. And here we have two excellent uh, contributors, uh, Fuad Kasanov, who is a senior economist at the IMF and also professor of economics at Georgetown uh, Washington University, and Reda Sharif, who is also senior economist. Um, and they both worked on the different issues in development economics. And it seems that their recent interest is in this area of uh, industrial policy. And I really strongly urge you to uh, look at that paper and, and uh, uh, see this valuable contribution. And I'm really looking forward to, to hear from them uh, today. So this is all in terms of um, introduction, who are the speakers. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, speakers will be talking first for 15 minutes maximum each, and uh, then we will have a um, really open discussion. In the past, that was the, the, the most interesting uh, part of it, where uh, you can either type in the comments, or if you, have, if you are direct in Zoom, you can uh, raise your hand. So the idea is that really this goes very informally and in very kind of uh, with intensive uh, interaction so that we really uh, all learn and spend interesting uh, uh, two hours. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce, uh, uh, let's start with, with the first presentation by Professor Gao Hudong. Uh, and I hope he can uh, share his screen. He will be talking about his uh, large scale programs uh, in, in China, and which is obviously it seems success story. So let's see what the rest of the world can uh, learn from that uh, experience. Of course, it doesn't mean that everything is transferable from China, but I'm sure that there will be interesting lessons for, for the rest of us. Uh, Gao, yeah, floor yeah. is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Slavo. Hello, everyone. Uh, good day. Uh, let me get started uh, sharing screen. So Slavo, I hope you can, you and the colleagues can, you know, see the- you Yeah, know, we, the, we can the, see, point. absolutely okay, fine. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I will, you know, uh, finish, you know, within 15 minutes. So the, the topic is using large scale programs to help develop technological capabilities. We have some cases. Uh, this is a, you know, agenda, the phenomena, the research question, literature, research methodology, key findings, and some discussion. Uh, the phenomena is like this. Uh, I'm sorry, let me move, you know, this uh, so that you can see it. Yeah, okay. So the phenomena is, you know, uh, in some areas, uh, in several sectors, uh, China has been uh, very successful in developing its technological innovation capabilities. Uh, here's, uh, you know, the, the sectors are what I mean. Uh, in telecom, uh, including telecom equipment and also telecom service, uh, especially in 4G and 5G. Uh, China has been uh, leading, uh, leading the world for many years. Uh, in ICT sector, uh, including the internet companies, uh, some of them are also making very uh, big you know, progress. In ultra high voltage transmission system, uh, led by the state grid, uh, China is number one in this area. High speed rail, very similar. Uh, in aerospace, uh, China I think is still behind the US, but is making very big, very quick uh, catch up. Uh, so here is just some pictures. Uh, high speed rail, for example, uh, even in 2017, uh, China accounted for 60% of a high speed rail uh, in the world. Uh, last year, 2020, uh, we have more than 33,000 kilometers high speed rail under operation. Uh, I think you know, that's more than 60%. Uh, uh, this is you know, the aerospace industry. Uh, then the question is, is you know, uh, why? Why you know, a developing country could make uh, such rapid progress in these high-tech uh, company, you know, uh, uh, sectors. So uh, the research question is the following three. How the eight large-scale programs 
were initiated. Uh, so we are, our observation is, you know, uh, these large scale programs are really important. Uh, so we selected eight of them. And what strategies uh, did the stakeholders uh, use in ex execute these eight programs? And what theoretical and practical insights we can draw from you know, uh, these uh, programs? Uh, we look at the literature, uh, especially three streams of them are very helpful. The first one is about uh, cost, complex product, uh, because they are different from consumer goods. And the second one is about large scale systems, because this kind of technical systems involves a lot of risks and high commitment uh, is needed. The third one is about strategies and challenges for developing countries' development of uh, large technical uh, uh, skills and adoption of COPs. Uh, usually uh, in these sectors, multinational companies are the dominant players. How local companies as latecomers can uh, deal with the challenge. So the methodology is a, a case study method, uh, but it's not about one you know, case. As I mentioned earlier, it's eight uh, projects uh, selected from uh, three uh, you know, studies. One is about 3G, another one is about innovation in state-owned enterprises. And the third one is uh, about user-driven uh, innovation, uh, especially uh, in big systems. We interviewed more than 140 people. Actually, after you know, uh, we started writing the paper, uh, no, not the paper, you know, writing the, the chapter, uh, we interviewed more people. So the key findings uh, include the following. The first one is about strategic intent. Uh, in the initiation of these large scale programs are based on strategic intent. Uh, especially changing the existing uh, user-producer relationship as suggested by Professor Longwell. Uh, the, the key point is to, you have to rely less on multinational companies, but more on local companies. I will explain why this is the case. The second finding is, you know, different strategies are used to build up the new user-producer relationship. And uh, we also find uh, the third finding, very complicated impact of government uh, and also social environment, government policy and social environment. Usually people think Chinese government are very supportive, but in fact, it's not. In some cases, very supportive. In some cases, they do not provide much uh, support. Uh, the last one is, you know, the crucial rule of outstanding leaders. I will give, you know, specific examples of that. So this is a figure to illustrate, you know, the uh, relationships among, you know, different factors affecting the uh, large scale program development. Uh, let, let me uh, look at the first finding, initiation. Uh, we find actually three types of initiators. The first one is big users. Uh, for example, uh, Shenzhen uh, Metro, uh, Shenzhen Subway, uh, uh, this company, they find uh, the equipment, the systems uh, they bought from multinational companies is uh, so expensive. They just could not afford it. In 1995, uh, for one kilometer, uh, subway line, the cost is 600 to 800 uh, million RMB. So that's, that's huge money. So the company just said, you know, we want to develop the subway. However, we just could not, you know, uh, pay uh, so high price. This is why they began to, uh, you know, uh, develop, uh, actually help local companies to develop uh, subway equipment. Uh, this is for users. Uh, producers can also initiate, uh, initiate, you know, uh, initiate the large scale program. Uh, the telecom equipment uh, sector is an example. 
the third one is government agencies. They can also uh, initiate uh, you know, this kind of uh, large scale program. Uh, strategies, uh, it's a three kind of strategies. Let me just you know, mention one of them. Uh, the first one, uh, if you know, the central government, uh, government agency is a key initiator, technology transfer from multinational companies actually is relatively easy because they want to work with uh, the Chinese central government. The market is so big, so very attract attractive. Here, the strategy is that how to leverage the huge uh, market, uh, huge local market to transfer technology. Uh, the impact of government policies and the social environment, as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, I don't want to repeat, but uh, it's not like uh, the society, the government always support uh, local innovation. No, actually, in some cases, especially, for example, in telecom equipment, in 3G, uh, the, the key, uh, you know, service providers, none of them want to, uh, you know, adopt the locally developed uh, technological system. Uh, the government, the policy is, uh, is very ambiguous. In some cases, in some time, they are supportive, but in many cases, not. Uh, finally, for some reason, they said, okay, we want to support. So that's why 3G become successful. And then that led to the uh, development of 4G and 5G. Uh, here, I really want to emphasize the crucial role of outstanding leaders. As I mentioned, uh, from the literature, we can know large-scale technical systems are very different from other projects. Uh, they are very risky, need a lot of investment, a lot of uncertainty, takes a long time. So how, do, how can, you know, uh, can we manage this kind of uh, programs successfully? It's very challenging. But one example, as I mentioned earlier, is the Shenzhen subway. Uh, one gentleman called Jian Lian, you know, the second point, Mr. Jian Lian, he's a vice president in charge of not only procurement, uh, but also operation. He stayed in that position for almost 20 years. Uh, that actually uh, make, you know, that assured uh, the success of this project. Uh, in other cases, we find a similar kind of, you know, pattern. Uh, we also noticed as a, if, you know, the tenure for the key person is not long enough, uh, the, 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 the program can't be successful. Uh, here, I think I want to skip, uh, but I want to mention one thing. Uh, in the development of this large scale, uh, you know, uh, programs, one, a major challenge is the so-called latecomer disadvantage. Means uh, local people, including government agencies, local users, local companies, do not buy from locally made innovations. So I think this is a very big challenge uh, to manage these eight programs. Uh, manage latecomer disadvantage is a big challenge, and that actually decided whether or not the program will be successful. So the discussion part, I think it will be very quick. Uh, I started with the research question. Uh, what we find is, uh, you know, the findings have some very important, I think, you know, theoretical and practical uh, implications. For example, uh, theoretically, uh, according to the literature, evolution of large technical systems in developed countries uh, you know, this, uh, you know, here, actually, let me show, in developed countries, inventor entrepreneurs, financial entrepreneurs, and also the consulting uh, engineers, they play very important role. But in the study about the Chinese cases, we find that is, uh, that is very different. Uh, actually, manager entrepreneurs, they are making crucial decisions. So their role is, uh, uh, you know, their role is the most important one. Uh, of course, I think this has practical uh, implications for local companies and also for multinational companies. For example, for multinational companies, 
uh, Chinese uh, market is very big. However, if you want to have a big market share, better not to keep your uh, product, your service at a extremely high price. Otherwise, local uh, users will be forced uh, to develop the alternative. So let me stop here. here. Uh, Slavo, I hope I you know, did not use up all the 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gao. Uh, yes, you saved us, uh, well, two minutes. Much okay, appreciated. Also. Not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for giving the, the, the really essence of the paper, which is extremely actually interesting to read because there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, real world insights. So I strongly recommend you to um, you know, read it uh, in, in its full version when it, when it becomes uh, uh, available. So there are lots of things for, for others to chew and I'll, we'll leave uh, discussion uh, at the end. So I would thank you very much. So I would like to now give floor to Carlo, Carlo Pietrovelli, who will be talking about the uh, industrial innovation policy in the world of global value chains. Uh, Carlo, I hope you can share your screen now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slavo. And, uh, and, and thank you all for, for being part of this uh, interesting conversation. Uh, the, the paper I'm presenting is uh, essentially based on the work that we produced for the, for the book, but it also includes some steps further that, that we've been uh, developing uh, after the book was, was finally approved. And, and in particular, I would like to focus on uh, uh, GVCs, global value chains, and how they need, they, they force uh, uh, a necessary rethinking of, uh, of industrial and innovation policies. Uh, the background, the, the, the starting point is that uh, GVCs still represent a remarkable share of international trade in spite of recent set setbacks, but let's show you some figures that confirm that uh, GVCs are still a, a very strong and important reality in the international economy. And, uh, and, and secondly, I will uh, argue that there is a, a lot of evidence that uh, leads us to think that GVCs and their governance and their way of organizing and coordinating activities across countries is intrinsically related to the development of innovation systems. And therefore taking into account uh, the co-evolution or the, or the mutual interdependencies between GVCs and, and innovation systems is very important. And that opens the door to uh, my argument that GVCs force to rethink economic policies. And I propose a little um, uh, typology and, and some examples of what I would consider uh, GVC-oriented policies. Um, the, first, the first argument is that GVCs are still a very important reality in uh, uh, the international economy. Uh, these are data from, from ONCTAD, this, this more recent data that confirmed the same evolution. Uh, foreign value added is that the, the share of trade that is uh, uh, made of imported inputs, that's one of the proxies for the presence of uh, value chains in international trade. And you see that over time, up, at the world level, the, the orange uh, slice has been increasing uh, over time. So this, there's been an increasing uh, relevance of value chains uh, over the years. Uh, after, tw after 2017, it's been a, a little slowed down, but uh, still, at least one third of international trade flows are related to uh, the working of uh, value chains. Yet, there is tremendous diversity across countries. Some countries take part very intensively in value chains, others do that at a much lower uh, level. Here I have uh, uh, data on, on, a, on, on a number of, of developed and developing countries. Um, and, uh, and, and essentially, uh, what we can notice here, this is a foreign value added, exactly the same uh, indicator I was showing before, uh, over a period of, of 10 years. And, and we see that uh, South Korea, for example, has been heavily uh, participating in, in value chains with, a, with an increase and then, a, and then a decrease. South Africa has constantly been in, on the increase. China, on the other hand, has been 
uh, strongly developing uh, domestic value added and 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 reducing the the um, the share of international trade explained by imported inputs gradually re, um, substituting these imported inputs with the domestic productions and and more advanced countries like like uh, european countries or, or the united states have as a percentage of of uh, exports they have lower shares even if within europe there's there's a remarkable extent of, of value chains but the message of this slide is that there's, there is diversity. Uh, the, the development towards value change is not shared by everybody and is shared to a different extent by, by different countries. And if we move to the sectoral level, we um, discover that this uh, diversity is even uh, more pronounced. Uh, look at, these are data for um, value chain participation uh, at the world level. On, on 64 countries that have been producing some hardware and some software. This is computer and electronics versus um, information technology and services. Again, 2005, 2015, and we see that uh, the computer electronics has a larger presence of uh, uh, value chain forms of organizational production, yet it is going down, this, this share is going down, Whereas it, it, it is exactly the opposite with uh, uh, information technology services uh, and software, which is going up. Look at the arrows there that, that show tendencies that have been uh, uh, recorded and that uh, have been confirmed over the last few years. So even within sectors, there are remarkable, uh, remarkable differences. Uh, and across sectors, there are remarkable differences in terms of, of value chain integration and, and participation. And that opens uh, 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 the door to my, my second argument. The first one was value chains, in spite of diversities across sectors and countries, are still a defining feature of the international economy. The second statement I would like to make is that innovation systems are related to value chains, and there is a mutual interdependence that I try to um, address with, with some with some colleagues in a, in a recent paper that is under assessment in a, in a new blog that came out last week. You find the references here, where essentially we uh, combine measures of uh, value chain participation with measures of the strength of the sector innovation system using mainly patents. And, and what we discover is that uh, the impact, the influence of uh, uh, value chain integration uh, on the development of innovation systems is not uh, a, a, a one way, it's not unidirectional. And on, on the other hand, there's, there are remarkable differences across the two sectors we studied, hardware and software, electronics and information services. And, uh, and we, you will see from the, from the next slide, uh, we managed to, to uh, group uh, countries according to different clusters that cluster uh, countries sharing similarities in their uh, innovation systems and, and extent of participation to uh, global value chains. And we did that for the hardware and the software sector on the left hand side and the right hand side of your slide there. And you see that the tendency has been very different. Uh, the first main result of this is that there is a remarkable cumulativeness of innovation in information technology sectors. So those uh, the countries that started with, with better innovation and better innovation systems and, and more patents uh, classified in many different ways continue to be dominating. There's, there is a, a path dependence or a, or a hysteresis here and, and a lot of cumulativeness. And secondly, the, the diagram on the left hand side uh, shows how in the hardware sector, an increased innovation capacity, which is on the vertical uh, axis, uh, is associated with a decreased GVC integration, which is on the uh, horizontal axis. So the improvement in the innovation, the sector innovation system does not go together with the deepening of uh, value chain integration. In the software sector on the right hand side, uh, the evidence uh, appears to show the opposite. Uh, look at the, the cluster S1 the, with, the, with the blue dots and you see that 
uh, countries that have been um, uh, further deepening their participation to uh, value chains also saw an increase in the uh, sectoral innovation systems. We don't claim uh, uh, to analyze causality here. The data did not allow us to do that, but we are uh, catching different pictures. And what we argue is that the, 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 the developments of the strength of the innovation system and the integration in value chains in these two sectors has been moving in very different uh, uh, directions and following very different trends. Uh, then, so we concluded that GVCs are still an important feature of the international economy. Uh, secondly, there is a, a strong connection between uh, uh, value chains and, and value chain integration and the development of sectoral innovation systems. Uh, we know from the literature and from uh, abundant empirical evidence that uh, a well-functioning innovation system is uh, an essential ingredient for, for a country's pattern of growth. And uh, this, this uh, forces us to uh, go deeper and try to understand what countries could do in terms of policies and how they would need to rethink their economic policies in light of the emergence and the integration in value chains. And, and, and what follows here is not so much reasoning on on, on policies for global value chains. Uh, we're not investigating uh, to what extent uh, value chains should be encouraged, uh, but rather we look into the, uh, how the different policies that could maximize, that could improve the capacity to benefit from value chains uh, could be shaped and could be implemented. Uh, behind the statement, there's, there's clearly the acknowledgement that uh, integrating into an, a value chain is not uh, per se sufficient to simulate growth, but um, the contribution of, of value chain integration to growth, productivity, uh, value added, adding, upgrading is also conditional on a number of different complementary assets and complementary activities and uh, government uh, uh, related uh, policies. Um, uh, the, the, the first uh, assessment I would like to make is related to, to my last sentence. Um, economic policies uh, and, and value chain oriented policies uh, need to face different challenges. And there, are, uh, there is a, a major uh, divide between um, policies to promote integration into, into value chains, getting access if, you, if you're not part of a or if, if your uh, enterprises are not part of a value chain, how do you get access? How do you integrate your, and uh, help integrate your, your firms into value chains? But it's also a very remarkable dimension. And the two men, uh, overlap in, in many instances and they complement each other or they can uh, lead to different outcomes, but they, they're worth uh, analyzing. Um, the same dimension uh, has to do with policies aimed at capturing value, gaining the rents, getting access to the rents that are generated along value chains. And that has to do, for example, with the, with the challenges that firms face whenever they try to enter segments offering the prospect of getting access to higher value added, uh, getting access to the different segments of value chain that can lead to an additional and, and the promotion of learning and innovation that can itself lead to a number of spillovers that will uh, end up having additional effects on, on the economy and, and its economic growth. And the development of technological capabilities that are related to a different extent to participation and integration in value chains in different segments of the chain. So the major divide, first getting access and then capturing value which can take place at the same time, overlap, but they are conceptually uh, different. And to, to try to explain and to try to, to uh, present the framework, I'll, I will use a, a simple uh, typology, which has been used in, in, in other exercises trying to classify um, industrial policies or innovation policies that stresses uh, two dimensions. Stresses the dimension of being a horizontal or vertical, 
Uh, I would agree with the argument that uh, if, we, if we analyze the issue very, very specifically, very with, with great attention, I would agree that there's no purely horizontal policy because all policies sooner or later will will end up being also uh, vertical, will also be uh, promoting sectors or promoting uh, uh, niches of uh, economic activity. But, you know, uh, for the sake of simplicity, there's a big divide between the horizontal and vertical policies. And the second dimension, the, the type of intervention, whether intervention, whether policies are related, uh, use instruments such as the provision of public inputs, the provision of, of, of the making of, of uh, um, public goods or, or club goods of different kinds, and the market interventions that would lead uh, uh, to different uh, uh, relative prices of products and, and factors. And the examples uh, you can easily capture from the, the photographs there are examples of, uh, think of, of the public inputs provided through uh, the provision of, uh, of the public goods, such as uh, uh, fitter sanitary controls for the, for the, for the fruit uh, export business, for example, that consists of a, of a public good made available by, by the government or through different uh, public private uh, arrangements uh, to help address a problem that is vertical, that is specific to a, to a sector. Or a market interventions such as, for example, a horizontal uh, research and development subsidy. So uh, research and development expenditures would be uh, supported and subsidized uh, whatever the sector of application is. And provided that the investment is in research and development activities, then they would enjoy um, a subsidy of different kinds uh, uh, from the government. So this is a simple two by two. Why does this matter? I Carlos, argue this could you, Carlos, sorry, could you just speed up maybe? Uh, yes, okay. Time. Thank you. Right. Uh, this matters because there's, there's different pros and cons in each quadrant. Uh, the risk of seeking and capture by individuals is very different according to different quadrants. And uh, the, the role of institutions uh, and, the, and the feasibility of, of supporting institutions or creating institutions to uh, promote and implement these policies is also very different in the different quadrants. And, uh, and I try to um, uh, use this um, uh, typology to uh, start thinking in terms of uh, value chain oriented policies and classifying them according to the, the horizontal vertical nature or the different instruments they, they would use. And you, you can see yourselves from the, the, this uh, matrix examples of uh, how, for example, a value chain oriented policy could be vertical that is focusing on specific sectors and providing public inputs such as, for example, um, skills training center related to the sector or improving the quality system of the country or uh, strengthening linkages and potential spillovers between uh, local um, uh, participants and, and, uh, and value chain uh, lead firms and, and so on. And, and similarly, if you go to the specific uh, uh, quadrants, you see examples of, of how the value chain uh, policies can take uh, form and, 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 can, and can take place in, in the different countries. Um, three examples, very quickly. Uh, one is a policy that was implemented in Costa Rica, uh, which I would call uh, a, a value chain oriented policy. There was a, a policy to modify the investment attraction policy uh, by uh, targeting uh, specific segments of the medical devices uh, value chain and considering that there was a missing segment of the chain uh, that was not available in the, in the country and that uh, uh, used to hinder the development of the, of the whole chain in the country, the Investment Attraction Agency, SINDA, uh, managed to go to the U.S. and attract uh, a specific uh, company in charge of uh, uh, serialization that allowed uh, uh, the value chain to uh, integrate this missing element and overcome this, this chicken and egg problem that uh, nobody was providing this kind of uh, serialization services. Nobody would provide them unless the rest of the value chain would be uh, working. And therefore, the government intervention helped in offering a solution uh, very consistent with the value chain logic. 
Second example uh, is comes from Malaysia, where we, we all know that uh, as far as value chains are concerned, the role of uh, uh, institutions and organizations in charge of uh, technology uh, provision, dissemination, uh, help with technological support of different kinds and, and the different kinds of, of certifications in place and the, the requirements of metrology and laboratory services and so on. Malaysia, the effort has been to uh, create uh, um, uh, government sponsored, uh, sometimes public, private, sometimes fully public uh, uh, institutions in charge of supporting firms integrating value chains with uh, advanced testing services at subsidized rates, as well as uh, different kinds of lab uh, exercises uh, related to the specific sectors and specific value chains by providing uh, public goods. Almost finished. Uh, Vietnam is another example. Uh, this is recently approved uh, supporting industry uh, policy framework, uh, still beginning uh, in its, its very inception phase. But uh, from what I see, from what I could study and, and, and understand, uh, it really looks like a, 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 a value chain oriented policy by um, helping uh, industries, local industries, uh, supporting their integration in value chains through the provision of different uh, subsidies and the building of different uh, public uh, goods and, and so on. Takeaways, conclusion, uh, GVCs still matter a lot. They still represent a large share of the uh, uh, organization, the prevailing international uh, organizational production. Uh, I could document some traces of a co-evolution between value chains and innovation systems. And I started uh, scratching the surface of what I would call a GVC-oriented policies, trying to sketch a classification and, uh, and providing you with, with some examples. There's more work that is coming out uh, in a special issue that we're editing with uh, Roberta Rabelotti and Ari Van Asche, where some of you are also um, uh, taking part in, and, and, and offering papers it will be out uh, in uh, July. Some of the papers that already highlight different dimensions of uh, GVC-oriented policies are available in the in the journal web pages, advanced uh, 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 publications there. And that's that's that. I can stop here. And thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, thank you very much for giving us a kind of neat uh, picture and uh, several kind of. For me, very interesting insights, which uh, I hope we'll, we'll come back to them uh, in the uh, discussion. Uh, because we are slightly behind the schedule, I would like to give floor to uh, Yevgeny, uh, who will be talking about the experimentalist governance for technology upgrading, new industrial policy processes. So something which uh, for maybe some of you will be quite uh, new type of insights. Yevgeny? Uh, yes, let me, let me start sharing screen. And um, thank you very much for, for the invitation to the book and for this workshop. Carlo actually put a, uh, set a stage for me very nicely. So uh, I can just as well start with vertical industrial policy because we uh, already talked about horizontal and it's the most controversial. Uh, so the question of the, of, of the chapter is how we can do vertical industrial policy right, uh, so to speak. And, and I'll start that, 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 that there is three major problems we are facing when we, when we are doing vertical industrial policy. Uh, is that uh, picking winners uh, in fast changing industries is, 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 is very problematic because winners are continuously evolving. Second, that uh, is capability uh, and information problem of the public sector. Uh, a tacit assumption that it's, it's, it has all the information it does not. And the third one, I would argue, is the most relevant now, uh, both in developed and, 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 and developing world. Uh, it is a capture by vested interest. This is political economy problem. So doing industrial policy invariably uh, faces so-called problem of disentrenchment. So how uh, we are proposed to deal with it, and uh, I'm saying this because this work deals or uh, uh, draws rather on a joint work with my co-author, 
uh, Chuck Sable, and many ideas is really due to him. Uh, so uh, the key assumption we have to now uh, admit that no one has a panoramic view of the economy. All views are partial. That means that we have to shift uh, from one time choice uh, to manage the process of error detection and correction in whatever choice that we make. Uh, and, and, and sort of a paragon of, 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 of this is a early stage venture capital. Uh, it's sort of, I would argue it's, uh, if we are facing private public venture, venture capital, for instance, it's a paragon of industrial policy process done, done, done right. Uh, and so in a way there is a parallel paradox. We are, have to make choices uh, without picking winners. And so how do we, a uh, question of the chapter, how do, how can we manage uh, this, this search process of making choices without picking, without picking business in the public sector, because public sector is involved, and how can we make uh, this process accountable, meaning that uh, if mistakes uh, are made, there is some accountability for them, but, but the mis mistakes are still encouraged. This is something, something very new for the public sector, because uh, we all know uh, mistakes in the public sector are not encouraged. And some, and some kind, sometimes they are equated with corruption, that if you made the mistake, there is some, some interest behind. Uh, and what is the incubation cycle of new industrial policy program? How they are conceived, corrected, and, and terminated, discontinued. So there is a, uh, this is the questions of the, of the chapter. I'm not going to uh, address all of them in the presentation. My task uh, is just to give you a gist of what the chapter is about. So, uh, a collaborative search and experimentation uh, uh, we are talking about. Uh, there are really two dimensions to it, two sides of the same collaborative process that agents with new capabilities uh, that the new industrial policy is created, uh, a new private sector which learns to innovate uh, by connecting to the world economy, and a new public sector uh, which is capable of providing complementary public inputs, they are emerging together as the two sides of the same collaborative process. And uh, basically what we see in our experience of the World Bank and, 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 and the literature, uh, that this process it can begin at least if, uh, if the most of the firms are rent seeking and the government on the whole rent seeking. That's a little bit of a paradox, but the issue here is heterogeneity uh, of, of, of both public and public sector. Uh, the issue is to look at, at, at whatever percent of exception we have and, and start uh, from there. And uh, there are three ingredients to new industrial policy process, I, I argue. There is a new generation of programs uh, which institu institutionalize such and experimentation networks. Uh, in the chapter, there are examples of that. It's, uh, for instance, YOSMA in Israel, supply development uh, program in Ireland, VC program in, in Taiwan, etc., etc., etc. There is a locus of experimentation, what we call a Schumpeterian development agency. The agency, which is, which, which, although in the public sector, it is capable of accountable experimentation. And, and again, the example which I discussed uh, in the chapter, it's an office of uh, chief, science, chief scientist in Israel, Foundation Chile, Scottish Enterprise. Um, and usually they um, emerge on the organizational periphery of the government meaning that uh, it's not sort of 
central attention of the government and for a while at least. And the key question is for a while uh, is that it's uh, able to experiment and get away with experimentation. Then usually uh, it's caught the attention of the mainstream and then the problems emerge. Uh, there is a number of work now on the so-called politics of partial success, uh, which discuss why a paragons in these slides of, of, of such as Office of Chief, Chief Economist, we all cite uh, Chief, Chief Scientist in Israel, why they lose their sort of innovation spirit in the spirit of experimentation. But that's beyond the preview of the paper. And, and perhaps the most important uh, is a diagnostic or problem solving monitoring, a procedure which would allow you to correct and detect uh, errors. And so just, just, uh, just one of these procedures I will illustrate in a bit more detail and, and I'm already drawing uh, to an end. We're all familiar with accounting monitoring. That's basically you juggle reports uh, and then you correct uh, mistakes uh, uh, as a, in a hindsight, so to speak. But uh, here the idea is to do a real, a real uh, time monitoring. That's why it's diagnostic or problem solving because the idea is to set the incentive structure that the participants of the process would have an incentive to reveal uh, their own errors. Why? Because they're learning from it. Uh, and some others would also uh, uh, learn from errors. And, and that's why you kind of shifting gears, you're picking winners in the process and winners itself are constantly changing. Let me give a real time example from Argentina. That's a, a, a micro level example uh, from Fundacion Praros. That's a biotech organization, a private public, which is set up uh, in the uh, province of Entre Rios to develop new varieties of rice. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting example of diagnostic monitoring because it sort of follows uh, venture capital procedures. Uh, they uh, have on-site visit of, of, of teams and experiment uh, when the problems surface, they correct them. And uh, most importantly, they also address uh, the problem of so-called living debt. If you have a pros, living debt is in, in venture capital par parlance, is a project which is barely successful. You have to kill it, but you don't have much of an incentive to do it because you already invested into it. It's in your own baby, so to speak. Uh, and uh, in, in this example of ProRos, they, they do it as well. Uh, they, they have to close projects which are not failures because that's fairly easy to close, but, but which do not uh, uh, show significant promise to continue with them. This is an example of disenfranchisement. An incentive structure is such uh, that it allows you to do difficult decisions. And the most difficult decisions in industrial policy is to how to kill things, how to close things. Because as we all know, inertia, organizational inertia is tremendous and, 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 and you have to uh, be very careful not to continue with activities which are no longer, which do not show promise. So I, I'm drawing to uh, an end uh, uh, of, of the discussion uh, and uh, there are a number of paradoxes in the new industrial policy process. In the paper, I developed seven. Uh, here, uh, just a number of them. We are well aware of accountable experimentation in the private sector. And we know that it's pervasive. In, in, a, in a way, uh, all the innovation in the private sector is based on this accountable experimentation. Example is of course open innovation, early stage venture capital, uh, 
Toyota style production, very limited role of public sector in all of this. Uh, this is the first paradox. The second, this is, was not always the case. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, if you look carefully, um, we had a whole generation of uh, this accountable experimentation in industrial policy in small local economies. Uh, Israel, Ireland, Taiwan, Finland would be, would be paragon of this. Uh, and then it so somehow subsided. One of the reasons I think it's uh, uh, centrality of new public public management, which actually says that look now you 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 don't need to to do experimentation in the public sector because then there would be a conflict of interest uh, between funding and implementation, and you can be taken to all the way to court if you give advice on implementation, uh, and if you fund. Uh, if you fund uh, the program uh, at the same time, for instance. And that's not how diagnostic monitoring is performed. You are not, you are not running the program, but you are actively engaged in the program. Uh, the good news is that there is a very heterogeneous bunch of, of second generation new industrial policies which are emerging. Uh, the, the, the best example, of course, would be China. Uh, but I gave an example of Argentina, which is unlikely uh, unlikely place to, to look uh, for the best practice, uh, because as we all know, Argentina is competing with Russia uh, for the price of being, uh, being the champion of creative corruption, because it, it's not just corruption, but it's constantly changing. Uh, so innovation goes in serenity. Yet, the heterogeneity argument shows that look, if you look closely enough, uh, you you can find episodes and example uh, even in even in uh, countries like Argentina, Russia, India, uh, and of course Chile. Uh, so uh, so there is a whole new uh, set of experiences which are coming. Which brings me to the second type of, uh, of uh, conclusion uh, that new industrial policy process it is basically empirical question. Is there capabilities to run it? Uh, how can we describe a life cycle of uh, good practice? For instance, how we can describe life cycle of Schumpeterian development agency, just other things in, in Schumpeterian world, uh, we have to be prepared that uh, uh, Office of Chief Scientist or whatever uh, Schumpeterian development agency is not going to be good forever. At some point, there is uh, should be a sunset clause. Uh, we have to examine empirically so-called best of the worst practice. Uh, good practice in a bad institutional environment. And this is uh, examples of Chile, Argentina, China, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then there could be also heterogeneity in failure. For instance, smart specialization program, which was designed, at least in its intention, as a, as a uh, new industrial policy program, on the whole, again, as experimental program, we can set aside other objectives. It's probably a failure, but within, uh, within it, you can say that, look, there is a bunch of, bunch of successful experiences. For instance, Basque Country was running an experimental program uh, before, and, and Basque County is quite successful within a program which is generally failed. So there is a kind of three uh, empirical question, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, so thank you very much for attention, and I'm looking forward to discussion and question, questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Evgeny, for first being uh, in time, and second, for uh, really giving uh, lots of uh, food for thought, uh, especially like your um, uh, paradoxes and economic successes, generally successes in economics seem to be about resolving paradoxes. So 
there's a lot of there that uh, I hope we'll have in the discussion uh, coming now. Uh, now we have um, uh, two discussants, uh, people that have uh, read these uh, chapters, and this will be really uh, IMF uh, view on, on these issues. So I would like to give floor to uh, Reda Sharif and Fuad Hassanov. We didn't talk exactly how you will, um, you know, who wants to go first and, and what is your kind of division of, of labor among you two. So uh, please, uh, floor is yours. Uh, who will come first? Um, uh, I can start, uh, Slavo. Uh, no problem. Okay, I Reza. guess. Okay. I guess I'll try to speak for less seven eight minutes, right, and then okay. to leave the floor Great. to Fuad. Um, first, congratulations. Uh, this is a, I think, great uh, I'd say contribution to you, Conley, and co-editors, um, and also for the these particularly for these three papers. Uh, so let me just take just one minute to say that really fits into what we've been working on with Fuad. Basically, we try to give broad principles of what industrial policy uh, should be. And by the way, just, Lavo, just to say, this is not the view of the IMF, not just to make this clear. Uh, <laughs> this is our own personal views. I'm so joking, it's, I'm joking. It's okay, exactly the opposite. <laughs> so uh, I'm just putting the disclaimer, basically. But, but basically, the principles we came to, or the, our conclusion in terms of broad principles, that there is a need for state intervention to move resources into more sophisticated, um, uh, I'd say, sectors. There is a need to emphasize domestic and local capabilities. And how do you do that? You have to focus on export orientation and you need accountability and competition, right? So you need the institution to do that. Now, the questions we usually receive is, how do you do this in practice? And these three papers, tackle different aspects of this how-to, right? How do you do it, uh, right, to make sure that, you know, the institution actually are capable of, you know, stopping or uh, uh, detecting uh, mistakes? How do they do to, you know, uh, continuously learn? And also in what sector should you go to, knowing that definition of a broad sector is really not, not enough. Sectors are actually uh, value chains, and then where do you go in the value chain, right? So each paper really, uh, tackle different uh, different issues, but now let me let me just first try to kind of emphasize some of the points that were in the papers, but perhaps didn't come up in the presentations. And I hope really people who are listening will read the all the papers because there are a lot of really striking information. So, for example, uh, uh, in in Gauss paper, um, one striking thing is that especially in the case of the, um, uh, of the metro of Shenzhen, is that the leader, right, or the person who's initiating the project, right, was kind of, of the, at the border between um, kind of private and public, between, you know, a, a technological institution and but also as a kind of this user, right? So I think uh, uh, Jianlin is the name, right? Uh, Gawi, correct me, please, if I'm wrong, but this person basically was, you can say broadly between the private and the public sector. So that takes me to a broad point, which is um, when we discuss these vertical policies, right? Coming back to Yevgeny's presentation, uh, one of the main differences between people who are for or against these vertical policies is that they assume that the public sector does not have technical capabilities. However, these technical capabilities first, uh, very often they are there, but also they are acquired. And then even more important, as Yevgeny mentioned, is that this is an endogenous process, right? There's learning by doing even within the public sector, right? So this is an important uh, point. The second point is that in many cases, the lines are blurred between public and private. So you can see it's very clear in the case of Japan, right? Which had this system of amakudari, which is descent from heaven. So civil servants will work in MITI until they are 55 and then retire and then lead some of the private sector companies, right? So you see that. So you have this also kind of this double sensitivity. So there are a lot of examples. I think you can even see it in the US up to the 50s and 60s when people in, at Bell Lab, right? This uh, big research, uh, uh, I'd say institution actually had also these double hats between private and, uh, uh, private and public. So this is very important. The same thing you see in the uh, experience of the uh, 
uh, uh, the Taiwanese experience with electronics, right? Uh, people at ITRI, this is the umbrella institution that kind of uh, uh, drove the effort to spin off uh, companies in electronic, also would have people who worked for a quasi public institution and then move right into the private sector. So again, you have these uh, lines blurred. So now to come back to the JFCs. So in a sense, when um, authorities try to be strategic where to go, I guess there's also, it's also important to know where do you go within the value chain, right? So when you look at data on export sophistication, what you see is that, for example, some countries may look like they're extremely sophisticated in their exports. I guess Malaysia and Vietnam are two good examples. But then when you dig deeper and then look at the data that Carlo showed us, right, you realize that, well, actually a lot of the value added is kind of imported, right? So important uh, uh, elements are coming from other countries. And you see some example of countries that were extremely strategic. So they went into the niches or the segments of the value chain where you, you had kind of the biggest rent or monopolistic rents, right? So I guess uh, semiconductor is an example within the value chain of you know, consumer electronics, but there are other examples. I think Nolan, Professor Nolan from Cambridge was explaining how you know, in some big value chains, you had some elements where you have really the oligopolistic competition. I think he mentioned it was a funny example is that uh, for aircraft industry, like I think there were perhaps one or two producer of toilets for planes, right? And they would provide these for both Airbus and, and Boeing. So really where you are is, is very important, right? So now, so let me finish also, I don't want to take all the time, but let me finish with, with a few kind of uh, questions. No, uh, they're pretty open, but um, first in terms of monitoring, right? Um, I think, one big issue that's missing or at least should be uh, uh, kind of um, developed is the need for non-market signals early on, right? When you start thinking about success, right, that's the kind of the big issue of, you know, when you look at, you know, early or I'd say uh, early, uh, early stages is that you don't have market signals and you have to give time for these new companies, right, to develop themselves. So what kind of signals do you look at? I think you've gonna touch, touch on, on some of them, at least in the paper, but how do you do this systematically? It's pretty difficult uh, uh, in my view. And then the second one is, you know, at what frequency do you monitor, right? If you go uh, to an extreme, it's too high frequency for a small firm, there's a cost, right? There's a cost of, you know, reporting, there's cost of monitoring. So I guess these are all, you know, as, as we described with Fouad in the paper, this is all uncharted territory, you know? So there is, as you again, you mentioned this kind of learning also. Now, in terms of JVCs, I guess the question I have is more: um, Can we really, how to say, link uh, Carlos work with what Gao showed us? No. So what Gao showed us is that you have these big systems of this complicated product, right? They're extremely difficult to do, and I guess a big country with a big population can take the risk to enter in these projects. But can we think about regional cooperation to try to do it together? Because I think one main contribution of Gao's work is to show us that in these complicated products, actually government made savings. So this has a fiscal, I mean, it's a quite striking result, right? That the, uh, that cities actually made savings by having their own, uh, let's say suppliers of, for these uh, metros, right? So. For developing countries, that's very important because maintenance costs are pretty high. But okay, so if you're a small country or a group of small countries, can you actually collaborate, uh, uh, right, to do that together? And finally, like just to finish, I guess now when we think about, okay, so these complicated products, when we think about these institutions that learn, right, and experiment, when you think about the value chain, now can we think also about not just public institution, but also private companies doing this experimentation, right? So I'm thinking about, for example, the role of Samsung in Korea, where you had these big companies that had a lot of suppliers. And there is this anecdote about this Samsung actually sending their own engineers to these small suppliers to train them and experiment, experiment with them and, and, and help them uh, 
kind of evolve. So maybe there's this, you know, we can think also of private companies doing some of these works, including working on these uh, complicated products. So, uh, well, so this is kind of my uh, un un unorganized uh, ideas. I'll, I'll leave the floor to Fouad, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Reda. Well, there are questions for all uh, three presenters, so I hope they've, they've, they've taken them on board. And uh, let's hear now uh, Fouad. All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Fouad. Uh, so I will continue, I guess, with, uh, with the thought process no, that we had uh, left off. Um, so I think one common theme uh, throughout all these papers was actually very interesting. You know, uh, a lot of kudos to the, to the authors uh, for the papers. Quite interesting to read. Um, one common theme is about the the tech, technology, and kind of building technological capabilities, right? Uh, so, and especially local firms or homegrown innovation, homegrown technology building. And Rida mentioned also that I think that's. Uh, what we found in our work too, especially when you look at middle income trap, how why countries couldn't escape or kind of, or kind of moving too slowly in, in the middle income before they reach uh, advanced country status, it may take decades and decades. And um, the key element, I, it's exactly this local technology creation. And, and I, I think the, there are different ways, I think these papers bring together this different ways of how you can go about this, right? So if this is very important of building tech capabilities, homegrown innovation, local technologies, uh, the questions, of course, it evolves around the sectors, right? And uh, uh, Gauss paper mentioned about this huge large scale programs, public infrastructure projects and so on. Uh, Carol's paper mentioned about GVCs, right? So we, we are thinking about sectors. Um, and there was a discussion in, in uh, both of these papers about what kind of policies to pursue, not to, to go into this. And then the third paper by Evgeny on kind of institutional framework, you know, which institution will drive that process of how you create technologies, uh, of what policies you implement. And, and this is another important element within this kind of industrial policy, innovation policy, you know, I, we called it true industrial policy or kind of, if you examine what it means, it's essentially technology and innovation policy. So it's a kind of the, the same acronym. Um, so the, the key element, I guess, is how you combine all these three, three key components, right? Of institutions, sectors, and then of course, uh, with, with policies, right? So if, if uh, I kind of, um, dig deeper into each, just quickly mention a few points. Um, of course, on, on the example of China about market for technologies, you know, the question is, how do we do this uh, in other countries, smaller countries, right? Where China, of course, could leverage its market to, to have technology transfers. For many other countries, it's, it's not going to be feasible. So there is some discussion in the paper about uh, research and development, some support for R&D, and of course, it's one of the major policies uh, that uh, Carol also has talked about. But the question is, of course, how do you do this, right? Uh, um, this is an important point. Another interesting point about the procurement, right? Uh, in Gauss' paper talked about this local governments or big firms even, you know, this procurement, creating this procurement uh, helped kind of sustain kind of long-term demand. Um, and the question is, of, how long, how much should you know? Should you, should you do this? Um, and I think another element it comes to also the paper by Evgeny about failures, right? So um, Gao mentioned about uh, like aircraft industry. I think some joint ventures in automotive weren't probably as successful. Uh, aircraft still uh, hasn't. Uh, become successful, but you know, it, it, it's still ongoing. So the question is, how do you assess failures? Or as you again said, when do you pull the plug, right? When do you discontinue projects? And that's, you know, it's also, I, I think it's still not clear um, from the papers for what you do at the end of the day. Uh, how do you decide? And, and I guess how long you let the, the uh, projects continue? Because, you know, 
in many cases in the past, when you look at successful cases, took took decades, right? Toyotas and Nokia's were profitable like decades later. Um, and the question is, of course, um, what 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 is the yardstick of performance, right? And how do you help uh, if there is progress, right? Or if there is no progress, how do you help to to make sure that there is progress? So I think it's still an open. Uh, open question. One interesting example that Caro brought up in his paper is about Costa Rica and medical devices, which is interesting because Intel left Costa Rica, you know, and, um, you know, I think it's just only R&D facility there now. Um, but medical devices kind of replaced that, uh, that hole, um, uh, that the gap in the, in, in the uh, production manufacturing and of course the exports of the country. Um, but it's, it's, it was mostly about multinationals at the end of the day. So Costa Rica, of course, is a small open economy, but the question is, uh, can, you know, there are, I'm sure there are local companies there too, but it's to a large extent, these are large multinationals, similar to essentially what Intel was, what was doing earlier in uh, electronics. How do you get local firms to engage with these multinationals, especially since they're already uh, in, uh, here in your country. And so how do you uh, engage with them and become a part of their value chain to improve this homegrown innovation technology and so on. So I guess there is this uh, connection, right? So being part of GVCs is not about FDI and multinationals, but also about this homegrown uh, technologies uh, uh, and connection. And I guess, um, you know, let me kind of maybe conclude the, the, at the end of the day, it's all about, of course, trial and error experimentation. So in that sense, I, I agree completely with Evgeny, you know, and um, it, it, I think Mariana Mazzucato has been also talking about this in her latest book, you know, it's not about picking winners, it's really about, you know, uh, essentially uh, providing this uh, support to the whole, um, you know, kind of the, this, ex, ex, you know, entrepreneurial or venture capital type of approach to support to the whole uh, industry of some sort or missions, right? And, and one interesting component to the, to, to, you know, to the, all these three papers was about these leaders, you know, the, the, the issue of leaders came up that, you know, and I think Evgeny cited uh, one case study on Russia when there was this, uh, charismatic leader, you know, they were doing quite many things. And once he left and became a minister, this whole group that he was uh, pushing forward in terms of science and so on kind of uh, became, uh, became kind of dormant. So the, the question is, is it really uh, about leaders per se, maybe in, to kind of spearhead or to jumpstart the whole project, but then you need these uh, processes, right? Institutional processes to for continuity purposes. And that's another important thing. How do you create that so that it's continuous uh, and doesn't depend on kind of charisma of any particular uh, leader, right? Um, and how do we start this Schumpeterian development agency uh, institutions, right? To, to, and make them sustainable, right? Rather than creating this Weberian bureaucracies as uh, Evgeny mentioned in his paper, right? I'll, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much, Fuad. I think uh, uh, presenters cannot complain that the discussion didn't read carefully the chapters. So that's uh, really uh, quite nice because very often discussion just carry on, you know, presenting their own work and ignore <laughs> what you have done. So this is really uh, very much uh, appreciated and, and uh, refreshing. Uh, before I give floor to discussions, I would like still to pick up uh, three questions. Uh, actually, we have already Sergios Alice who would like to make a question. And then uh, we have uh, also on the, in the chat, we have a few more questions. Um, but let's give uh, opportunity for Sergio and, and then we'll give to um, discussants um, opportunity to, to uh, sorry, to, to speakers to respond to, to uh, the, the questions posed by discussant member Sergio. Sergio. Thank you, Slavo. Good morning from Brazil for everyone. Thank you for this uh, excellent presentations for the three presentators. 
I this is just one thing about uh, I, I'm trying to to gather all the three presentations in one question. I put the question in the chat. It's more or less the following: um, the problem of getting in a global value chain for a less developed country, as it is our case in Brazil, for instance. This is the catching up discussion is an endless discussion for many countries, and it is the case here in Brazil. And uh, I was wondering, listening to, to you, that uh, uh, the, 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 million, the, the million dollar question that used to be, what are the links in which we have to go into in the global value chain in order to take part in this global value chain? And the, the following question is how to uh, appropriate more value in these links. This, uh, uh, this million dollar question now, I think, moves uh, to another uh, part, another question, which is besides having to identify these links in the global value chain is where to, to fit in, we also have to, to ask uh, uh, how to uh, implement it. I mean, this is much more, wouldn't it, much more a thing of uh, an issue of uh, the science of implementation. I mean, wouldn't it be much more a thing of uh, uh, designing how to implement and how to monitor it in a long-term perspective, whatever be the, the links or the parts or the slots in the global value chains you want to be in. Uh, otherwise, I think we, we have tried to do this many times in many sectors. This is not only a question of a, a sectorial, a vertical or horizontal policy. It's much more a question of designing and what the last presentation said, monitoring the implementation and having a, 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 a kind of a durable and permanent uh, care over the, the policies that uh, uh, are being implemented. So this is, I, mean, I, I looking at the past here in Brazil, the many different policies that we try to implement in order to, uh, to develop some sectors or even for horizontal policies. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, testified that uh, the, the, the problem, the, the, the central problem for us is that we do not monitor, we do not adjust, we do not make any kind of corrections of uh, path during the implementation of such a policy. So uh, I, I wonder how to, it's not only a thing of how to identify uh, how to access, but also how to appropriate value in an uh, increasing way. And this is much more a question, I repeat this, of, uh, of uh, having a capacity for implementation. And that's why I'm, I'm suggesting here that uh, this discussion of catching up uh, has to in incorporate more and more the science of implementation. This is, this is my comment. Thank you, Zahra. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sergio. I suggest now, before we go to the second round of questions uh, we have from Christoph, uh, I would uh, ask now all uh, speakers if you would like to address uh, questions, uh, points raised by Reda Fuad and now also the points by, by Sergio. I don't know if you want to go in inverse order or the same order. It's up to you. Um, Gal, could you, would you want to start first? Uh, yeah, I think Carlo will be better because, you know, that concept is uh, developed by him, but uh, yeah, let me say a few words. Uh, I uh, first, you know, thank all you know the the, the two actually you know uh, uh, commentators. Uh, it's, it's great actually. Uh, I learned a lot. Also, you know, uh, the, the the question about you know uh, access and benefit from uh, GVC. Um, I really like the idea of uh, regional uh, you know uh, collaboration. Uh, because for developing countries, uh, a key challenge is we do not have much resources. We do not have much uh, capabilities. So this reminds me actually Professor Michael Porter's work. 
So innovation is a process. It's, it doesn't matter if you start from a low point, but if you can continuously to innovate, the results uh, will be good. Uh, so in that sense, I think, you know, even small countries, uh, smaller countries can collaborate uh, to do uh, innovation uh, in big project. So that also provide a way for the access and the benefit uh, from uh, the global uh, value chain issue. So let me stop here very brief. Thank you very much. That was exactly, you know, my question was to you also because of the Chinese uh, larger market, how, you know, is that uh, transferable? But this idea on the regional collaboration is, is a very nice answer to that. Uh, Carlo, would you like to uh, address uh, questions on your part? Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you very much for all these interesting questions and comments. I mean, it's really, um, it's really hard to choose where to start from because most of the questions are very, very interesting. And, uh, and if I were to summarize uh, it all, I would say that I would agree with many of the questions and I think that they stress very relevant issues. And let me quickly go over some of the of the concepts that I that I uh, share very much. Um, Fuad was somehow hinting at the. I would translate this as as a, a micro foundation of industrial policy, or really understanding the details of of um, uh, technological uh, capability development at the firm level, and shaping industrial policy accordingly. And that's something I, I, I totally share. I think it is very important. Um, and it, it also, this also links up nicely with what Sergio was suggesting. Um, um, I, I, I would agree uh, that the key issue is not uh, deciding uh, uh, which uh, links to, uh, to attack and which segments try to get into and which uh, uh, value chain uh, lead firm uh, uh, lure with uh, incentives to uh, induce them to locate in your, in your or do business with uh, with the companies in your country? It, it is probably more uh, an issue of developing local capabilities and uh, and strengthening uh, domestic institutions as well as firms and and uh, government agencies. Uh, uh, so that they then can get access or uh, appropriate of the valuable segments of the value chain. But the, 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 the little piece of evidence that I was showing before on the, on the hardware and software, the electronics and, and software sectors, that would, uh, would hint at the, 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 a sudden separation of GVC development, GVC integration and uh, innovation systems are deepening which would suggest that value chains can offer opportunities, but the, the, the autonomous effort of developing capabilities and developing institutions and strengthening your, your own uh, country's uh, uh, firms and institutions is essential in, in whatever circumstances. And, and, and I would argue that you know, what makes a difference is that uh, in, in a world of value chains, uh, uh, this should be consistent with the shape that the world uh, is taking, the shape of the international um, transactions and the international collaborations uh, are taking. But, but the, 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 the focus on strengthening your capacities, regardless value chains or regardless what happens outside, but really investing in, in the strengthening of your local firms is, is, is very important. And they, that needs to be micro, micro, micro founded that is understood deeply in its microeconomic um, uh, explanations and, and, uh, and mechanisms. Um, the, I wonder whether the, the word uh, science of implementation that Sergio was proposing is the, the right one. Uh, listening to Eugeni and, and Gao, I think is, is, this is also a matter of, uh, of, of of clever practice or, you know, like cooking that you can have a recipe, but then if you don't have all the tacit knowledge and, uh, 
and the uh, and, uh, and the and the capacity to to flexibly adapt to circumstances and convince and convene and and interact. So that that would make it a bit different and far from from natural science. I mean, there's a lot of something that is there implicit and tacit that that is required to to implement uh, uh, carefully whatever kind of policies. And 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 I would agree that the if I were to uh, strike a balance, I would say that the, the the focus should be on the on the implementation, on the how. We can discuss, and, and more or less, we all know what should be done, but then how to do it in all the issues you mentioned, the the value chains and regional cooperation. That's a wonderful idea, but how do you do it? And uh, the the you know sometimes it, it 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 was generated as an autonomous investment or, or decision of, of multinational corporations or governments or trade trade collaborations or trade trade agreements of different kinds. But you know uh, it, it it is really hard. I mean, it's this is something that's been spoken of in, in many parts of the world. But then the how is is again very very important. And, and with all the, the, the issues that Eugeni uh, mentioned that uh, most of them I, I agree very much, but again, it's really a, a matter, it's a little bit of a ma magic, a little bit of the practice and the details and the and understanding and considering the context and the circumstances which make it, uh, it, it, it very hard to develop uh, policy making uh, uh, skills, but you know, uh, that, that's something that needs to be developed. Well, I'll stop here, I would have many more, but uh, Thank you. At least now we legitimize something which you can call science of implementation. So let's uh, not uh, throw it out of the table. Let's keep it on the table. Uh, Evgeny, you've got a lot of uh, questions on your part here. Well, mo most questions to me were open-ended. Uh, so I will only, I think, at this round of answers would, would focus just on one procedure uh, which everyone mentioned is, is uh, in, in their comments, uh, is, is monitoring. And, and, and the issue I, I would like to emphasize that it's, it's really about getting an incentive structure which allows to generate knowledge in the process of monitoring. It's not like you, you are setting the, choosing the, the indicators uh, and, and then deciding uh, on the point and then, then somehow producing a graph. At certain point, there is inflection point and you decide to stop there. There is a process in which uh, by magic, if you wish to, uh, to, to quote Carlo, uh, the decision arises. Uh, but then the trust to develop such uh, such structure where you would be willing to show your own errors and the motivation for that develop gradually. It, it's a process of time. Let me give an illustration of what I have in mind. Uh, uh, in one of the talks I was invited to give in a, uh, this smart specialization program was actually in Barcelona, which is a fairly good example. It's quite a developed environment. Uh, with private sector people who told me openly that one condition for, for the talk, uh, for, for their discussion, is that no public sector people are present. Because if, if just anyone is present, you would just, we would just obfuscate everything. We, wouldn't be, we, would, have, we would have any motivation to, uh, uh, to, 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 show, to share our own errors. They, they wouldn't understand. And that's Barcelona, which is, you know, fairly, fairly developed environment. So that just shows you where most such settings are, are starting. Uh, be, because, uh, again, uh, venture capital firms use almost no indicators. It's all the setup which actually, uh, uh, which actually provides the, 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 the motivation to, 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 to share your own errors because you learn from them and everyone learns from them. And that, that magic of mutual learning develops very, very, very gradually. It takes time to develop this trust, 
but uh, the example from Argentina and uh, you know, Russia and India show it can be done. It, uh, then the question in which segment it can be done and how it can be scaled up. That I think is the, the key question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evgeny. Uh, I suggest that we now you try to address uh, two questions uh, which are in the chat by uh, Krzysztof Szygielski. Uh, I can read them for people that are on YouTube. Uh, question one to Professor Pietro Belli. Is there a case for giving the GVC related innovation policy a priority over the regular STI policy? Given why? Because given the limited capabilities and resources of the public sector in the developing catching uh, up countries, so do you prioritize then the GVC compared to your regular kind of? Uh, second question is uh, also for Karla and for Yevgeny. There doesn't seem to be any regularity when it comes to success stories of new industrial policy. Do we know anything about the organizational structures that seem to be more successful than others? For instance, in terms of scale or the place in the public sector and political system. So any kind of, uh, well, generalization or, or lessons on that part. Um, do you want to address these two questions now? And then we have a, 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 this is a question also a comment from Joanna Castelli from National Technical University of Athens. Industrial policy becomes particularly relevant when thinking the amount of resources to be invested for green transition. The question is whether we could go ahead curbing climate change without some vertical type of policy to boost sector transformation and without the public sector with capabilities to monitor, assess and design really coordinated measure. If you also want to avoid greenwashing. I hope you are familiar with the term greenwashing, pretending that I'm doing something about green and not doing anything. So yeah, I don't know who would like to address this third question, but uh, all three speakers and I would also invite discussant if they want to uh, add anything here. Um, who would like to, to start first from either the discussant or, or presenters? Maybe, yeah. Cover you. I guess start with yeah. question one that is directly yeah. related to GVC related innovation policy. And uh, I don't think I wouldn't I wouldn't formulate this question uh, in, in terms of, of priority. I mean, what, what I'm arguing is that uh, GVC related innovation policy is not something different from regular STI policy. What I'm arguing is that regular STI policy needs to take into account G the existence of GVC and therefore a regular uh, has no reason to, to, to remain the same it used to be, but it needs to be rethought and reformulated in light of, of, of value chains. So, so say, for example, um, uh, promoting the development of technological capabilities of firms through um, uh, different kinds of, of, of subsidies or mechanisms to, to promote innovation investments. Um, but then having that related to the nature of, uh, of the, inter the industrial organization that is prevailing that oftentimes has to do with, with value chain. So, so for example, specific programs related to strengthening technological capability development of local firms engaged or willing to engage in value chains and somehow combining the or shaping the innovation policy in a way that considers the way business is being done in, in through this, this value chain mechanism and so on. So it wouldn't be either or, but it would be a matter of, of rethinking traditional STI policy in light of something important that is happening that is value chain organization. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yevgeny, uh, any irregularity when it comes to success story, anything about the organizational structure? Um... Yes, we actually know quite quite a bit uh, about uh, what, uh, about these irregularities. Uh, first of all, that there are, the risk has to be shared between public and private sector in, in a new industrial policy program and, and the amount of subsidies or in general public sector contribution which, which, you, which, you, are, which you are giving uh, has to be actually quite small. Uh, so it wouldn't be, uh, so, so the participant wouldn't be engaged in a rent seeking competition. 
for instance, in case of Russia, uh, in this mega project case, uh, they, the really serious people went for uh, much more sizable uh, programs and much more sizable uh, give outs. Uh, so you, you are leaving out people who are after innovation, not after rent seeking. One example would be how you, how do you uh, promote uh, early stage venture capital fund? It's always, it's always private public. You always uh, um, ask for 50% contribution from the private sector, which you have to find. And, and the whole uh, art and craft is to, to, uh, to set up a, a, a structure which would actually give leadership uh, to, to the private sector, which means that you don't have much of a, a scope, so to speak, for, the, for, for this new industrial policy program. It means that if you do it right, it's not about disbursing money. For me, as a public sector official in the World Bank, it's always a problem. I have to move money. And the, and the money is not moving very smoothly or, or fast here. In fact, they're moving slowly because you are growing a new structure, so to speak. So this is, would be one regularity. Uh, second regularity would be uh, about these agencies. They are always uh, invariably uh, public in purpose, uh, but private in structure. Uh, and that's why they usually operate uh, not just on the periphery in the government, but outside formal government structure, so to speak. Because you have to give uh, uh, people who are uh, working on it fairly good remuneration because they are uh, competing with private sector. Uh, so they're often exclaves uh, in the public sector, meaning the extension of a global knowledge economy. Uh, in the in the public sector, uh, but now they have fairly good knowledge how actually to do this public sector exclave. That would be sort of second type of lessons we have learned. Uh, and 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 by the way, talking about success is a little bit too uh, ambitious, I would say. Promise uh, would be a better word because you have some programs that are doing great, but you have a, a having, this is the same portfolio programs, you're having programs which are not doing that great. And that's normal, because again, you're living in Schumpeterian world, everything cannot be successful. Uh, that's a lesson which, uh, which is not easy to swallow in the public sector, but, but that's unfortunately the way, or fortunately the way it is. But and, it, it, yeah. And the third regularity is there, yeah. again, there has to be some kind of, of procedure for uh, at which point you discontinue or restructure your project. Uh, uh, and, and, and in the paper, uh, I give an example how it's done, for instance, in DARPA, how it's done in RPE, in, in, in Fundacion Chile. It's always different procedures. So there had to be good policemen and bad policemen, so to speak, uh, and 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 they have to be in communication because because a good policeman kills. Uh, it's the most hated person or the department uh, in the organization, but but it's but it's a function which has to be present. So I, I will stop at that. Could I provoke you further on these things because? Uh one of the conclusions from your presentation and, and your work with uh, is that um, these um, um, successful agencies come from periphery. But uh, if you're right in this, uh, that these organizations have to be public in purpose or private in structure. But my question is, do we really then assume that, sorry, this can only come from periphery, never from the core. And when it come, becomes a core, then it will be killed. So then you all the time have this vicious cycle. Uh, why maybe this is too pessimistic? Uh, if I think about the successful FDI agencies in some countries, and let's say I'm familiar with the, with the Czech Invest, which is doing exactly that, 
public in purpose, private in the way they operate, and very successful in integrating foreign companies into local value chains. <laughs> and I'm, my question is, is it really impossible to think about the organizational public sectors, not whole public sector, but segments of public sector on a much larger scale, which would operate on similar principles? Is it just a um, kind of uh, lack of <laughs> imagination to make this type of uh, uh, reform, which would go then obviously beyond the uh, um, new public management. And, and maybe this is something which simply uh, hasn't yet been taken seriously. I mean, does it really always have to be from the periphery and then killed? Or is it really situation so pessimistic that it's impossible to think about it that can come within the core of the public sector? Slavo, uh, the, I think the, the promising answer uh, and or the encouraging answer that we don't know. Uh, that's why I, I, in my last slide, I, I put the, the research program. It's largely an empirical program. Uh, you, you give an investment of Czech Invest. Uh, uh, I can quote a, a book of Daniel Ormston, which is called characteristically good policies gone bad. Uh, it's about Finland, Ireland, and all our paragons. <laughs> which is not very pessimistic account of how good policies, you know, why they go bad. Uh, I, it, the, the, maybe I'm looking on those examples at the, at the glass, which is half uh, empty, which is uh, half full. So I became too much a child of the World Bank <laughs> itself. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but again, it's it's an empirical program here for for another research question to answer uh, it answer your very good question. Okay, we we have a question from Jana. Jana, do you want to come yourself? I, I read your question, but uh, um, I can reinterpret it. But uh, do you want to come directly, maybe, and ask? It is related to this uh, um, carbon uh, curbing climate change and and whether this can be done by um, horizontal policies, but you, you explain yourself, okay? Okay, thank you for uh, giving me the, uh, to, to, to talk about that. I, I just wanted, because I was uh, hearing uh, all these uh, types of measures that and uh, the types of industrial policies, and uh, uh, so I, I was wondering if uh, in the actual recent discussion, and uh, the, uh, what is recently happening with uh, uh, investment for green transition and so on. Um, I think it is very relevant to discuss, uh, first of all, for also vertical policies. Uh, and secondly, regarding uh, uh, the presentation of Yevgeny, uh, 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 on the public sector and the capabilities of the public sector, I think it is also very relevant to, to discuss for the capabilities of a public sector that uh, would be uh, able uh, also to, to monitor, to, to assess and, and design measures that uh, uh, are coherent and uh, uh, could uh, be uh, really in the direction of, uh, of uh, green uh, uh, and uh, assuring green transition and not all only uh, be labeled as green. Uh, and this uh, reg is regarding the, uh, the capability of, of uh, the public sector uh, having the technical capability of designing uh, measures that would assure such, such a transition. Uh, so uh, I don't know if uh, uh, what is uh, the the opinion. I'll, I'll, I'll give floor to 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 speakers and discuss them. But my my reaction would be immediately. Well, any policy has to. In case of greenwashing, there are very capable guys on the other side. So kind of. Uh, <laughs> so you're not talking only about the public sector capabilities. You are talking also the capabilities of the of the market uh, agents of the companies. How they can always kind of orchestrate or accommodate any kind of uh, uh, rules in which they have to operate, which is a... Uh, yes. But okay. I, I give floors to others. Anybody wants to come on this issue? Or it's too difficult? 
No. I think uh, Gao uh, is uh, asking. As he raised the hand, I don't see him. Gao, do you? Yeah. Gao is here. Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, very brief. I think you know the carbon emission, uh, emission is a very big issue uh, all over the world. Uh, what I just want to share, you know, what I observed in China, uh, the the I think you know both uh, two kind of forces. One is at the very very you know uh, uh, top, the central government actually President Xi Jinping he himself is pushing for uh, you know reducing carbon emission. And we can see many companies, especially state-owned ent uh, enterprises, are taking very active, uh, you know, uh, actions to follow uh, what he, uh, you know, he, he is uh, wishing uh, people to do. On the other hand, we also have actually observations about uh, the bottom-up uh, forces. Uh, some companies actually, for many years, they realized if they can be more environmental friendly, uh, they can benefit from that kind of you know, practice, uh, not only politically, but more importantly, you know, uh, economically, uh, their competitive advantage increase because you are adopting new technologies. Uh, so I think you know, I observe two uh, you know, uh, forces. Uh, you know, borrowing from Professor Robert Bogoman, uh, from uh, Stanford, I think it's uh, called you know, the, the planning innovation and the autonomous innovation. Autonomous here probably is um, the bottom up process and the planned uh, you know, innovation is uh, guided by the central government. So this is just sharing some information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have six minutes literally I uh, do discussions wants to come also with a final one minute uh, kind of reaction thought. Um, yeah, I can, if you are, I can please. start, yeah, I guess, yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I guess following up on uh, Joanna's uh, point, you know, I, I think it's, it's exactly right. You, you know, the state could find ways to implement industrial policy, especially we already know the technologies are already here. So it's not, you know, there are different angles there where you have to innovate, create new tech, but we already have existing tech like electric vehicles, renewables that need uh, basically much bigger penetration. And of course, without the state, uh, the market will just take too long uh, to do so. And we don't have time, right? So in that sense, you, you, you can, uh, and that, you know, fixes huge part of, of, of uh, all these carbon emissions. You know, if you almost, I think you go to 80, 90% if you just go to transport and renewables uh, industries and so on, it pretty much uh, takes care of most of the carbon emission, uh, which exactly what you wanna do. Um, and another important point, I, I guess it was also brought up in the chat questions, how do you do it in the environment when, when you don't have capabilities, especially on the public sector side. And, you know, this goes back to, you know, uh, how do we do it in developing countries, low income countries and so on, becomes much harder. But at the same time, it's uh, uh, learning by doing, right? It, it's the industries uh, and, and sectors, and of course, public agencies that need to focus on exactly what they're trying to accomplish, which sectors they're trying to revive, support, whether it's GVC, whether it's large scale program, right, the regional cooperation. And, and then, you know, they're trying to, to get the right processes in place, experimentation and so on, as Evgeny mentioned. And this would, you know, hopefully will start this uh, uh, good cycle of, of kind of learning by doing and improvement. And that's what East Asia did, no? Koreans did it in the 50s and 60s when they were pretty poor and they've developed the right agencies. Singaporeans done it in the 60s with Economic Development Board. So, uh, you know, Taiwanese with E3 and so on. So these organizations uh, exist today and uh, they've been pretty successful uh, in, uh, you know, for decades. And of course, you know, doesn't mean they will be successful going forward, but yeah. they have this uh, mm -hmm. process in place. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Fuad, uh, last, uh, you have one minute if you can uh, have your 
Ah, sorry. You mean uh, you mean uh, Red Army? Sorry, Red sorry. Yeah. 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 I'll be I'll sorry. be very quick. I don't I don't have much to add, but I, I agree with uh, Joanna this that basically industrial policies could be the correct framework to think about you know uh, fighting climate change. I mean, I could think of it also as kind of a mix of a uh, Apollo program, you know, on steroids plus the issue of diffusion of technologies, as Fuad mentioned. Uh, you know, because you want to diffuse it within advanced economies, but also toward also developing economies. And we want to do it fast. So I guess that's maybe it's one of the questions uh, we have to think about. But then just to conclude, I guess one point I want to make is about the definition of failure. Because very often when there is this, an effort, determined effort to develop capabilities in something sophisticated or actually innovative, it's not a true failure if you take a bit longer kind of time frame because usually it produces capabilities that applied somewhere, right? So like the SAGE program led to the computer, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, um, uh, how to say, uh, uh, suppliers of, uh, of Petronas in Malaysia uh, became pretty good at engineering uh, for other type of sectors, right? When the oil price fell. So I guess when you go for difficult things, right? There is success, but it might not be where you think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are running, we, we've run out of time. So we will have to close here with the three final points. Uh, four, one is you, we have a still comment from Sergio. You can uh, look at it in, in the chats, uh, but we simply don't have time anymore to address it. First uh, point is, uh, I would just like to inform everybody that uh, one of the editors of, of this volume, Kun Lee, is uh, being appointed also chair of the Government Council of Economic Advisors. So uh, I'm proud to say that finally, neo schumpeterian economists are becoming influential and uh, he will be also taking part on an expert meeting of G7 group, uh, which is the, 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 the highest policy impact that one can uh, imagine. So, uh, which means that uh, neo schumpeterian economists are now part of the story and carry part of the responsibility. So please take your own research with, uh, with much more kind of uh, being serious and, and this is, you're not anymore in the corner, you are getting into the core. So that's the first thing. Second is that the final workshop of, of this series will be on 22nd of, of April. I hope to see most of you uh, at that time where we'll try to wrap up all the teams. And the final point is uh, Paolo Zamislak, who is professor from University of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, is organizing a very interesting event uh, very soon. And uh, Paolo, could you inform the, the audience about the event? Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. How are you guys? Well, Carlo is here. He will be with us in, 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 this, in this event. Kion also. We are uh, somehow celebrating 30 years of our research group back uh, here in the southern Brazil, NITEC. And uh, we have uh, gathered some friends all around the world to speak a little bit on innovation studies, innovation capabilities, and issues uh, related to that. Uh, if you will, Slavo, can I, I, I share a 10 minutes, 10 seconds? Uh, 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 Could you uh, enable him to share? Screen? Uh, yeah, I, Just I've to enabled show you okay. the call. The call. Me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, this is it. Here it is. Uh, we call it uh, opening the black box of innovation capabilities. Those are the guys uh, that are invited. This will happen on 13 and 14 April. So in like two weeks from here to three weeks from here. And uh, get our site www.nitech.co like this. And uh, you have the, the, the final program and uh, will be uh, like four round tables, two round tables for, per day. And I think it will be uh, an amazing opportunity for uh, discuss all those issues that we have doing. I, I, I was looking forward uh, to, to this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slavo. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to speakers. Thanks to discussion for really uh, contributing and, and making it uh, really good uh, learning experience for everybody.